Well, good morning, everybody. It is Sunday. This is the day that we celebrate the triumphal entry. And I was, as I was praying this morning, I really thought about tradition. And I think right now our traditions are all changed. But yet, the truth of the world, the light of the world, Jesus Christ has not changed from that very moment when he entered into Jerusalem, which we are going to celebrate today on that triumphal entry. He was king. He is still king. So I want to welcome you to, it is Sunday, April 5th. You have tuned in to Grace Baptist Church here in Bristol, Connecticut. I am Pastor Tom Barron. You see behind me a couple of gentlemen. We're going we're gonna to lead you in worship in a few moments. We would just ask that you sing along with us and you enjoy today and be challenged today because we're going to talk about who is this Jesus. And there may not be any other questions that are as important as that. So before we move into some worship, I just I have a few announcements. I just want to remind you that Monday through Thursday this week, we will have our morning devotions at 9.30. Wednesday night at 6 o'clock is our Bible study. We're going through Luke. Thursday at 7 o'clock at night, 7 p.m., we will be having uh, our Monday, Thursday service. We'll be doing it right here. So we'd ask you to tune in and we're going to look at it. It's, it's what a great day and, and what happened at that Last Supper and how Jesus showed us his heart for us. And then Good Friday. I really want to encourage you to join us on Good Friday with a day of prayer and fasting. I'm going to be putting out a schedule. They'll be getting things from the church office about how we can pray, how we can pray for our neighbors, how we can fast. It is not just Grace Baptist here. We are doing this as a church movement across the United States and across the world with the other converged churches. We're going to start off at 9 a.m. with about an hour of prayer. You'll get all that information on how to do it. You'll be tuning in with churches from all over the world. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll have it more focused into our region here in the Northeast. You know, we have 100 churches that are coming together for this. And then in the afternoon, We'll have a couple devotions for you to, to sign in that I'll do. And then we'll have a very special message toward the end of Friday, probably around 6 o'clock when we traditionally will be doing our service. So we're just going to focus in on Friday. But today, we have the triumphal entry, the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem to deliver us, to free us. And I want to encourage you to worship with us. And then the message is to discover who this Jesus is and what he means to you in your life. So let's, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. He's going to open us in a word of prayer and we're going to worship. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you that we can gather together this morning. And it's so true that the church is far more than just a building. The church is your people. So Lord, we thank you that that is true and that no matter where anyone is located this morning, you're watching from uh, their homes or wherever they may be, that even though we may not all physically be, be gathered together, that we are still together. We thank you, Lord, for that unity. And we thank you, Lord, that your people are the church. Help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth and to celebrate that, Lord. And no matter where we are right now, may we invite your Holy Spirit in. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. 
to be here, as we're able to, to gather together virtually, I guess as they say, but what, a, uh, what an honor it is, and we thank you, Lord, for that. So I think any time we, we enter into to this time of the year as a pastor, it's exciting that we, that we get to share God's Word that we get to share the story of Jesus Christ, that we get to many times share the stories of, of what he's done in our lives. And, and so often when we gather together as a, as a church family and, and we're able to share that through testimonies and, and we get to know each other. And again, this year being a little different, we don't always have the traditions that we're used to. But again, I want to keep emphasizing today, you know, we may not have the tradition that we're used to, but we have Jesus Christ. And with him in our lives, there is nothing that we can't get through. And I had somebody, somebody say to me this week, you know, Pastor Tom, how would we, how, how do people get through right now who don't know Jesus Christ? And I can't answer that question, but what I can answer is that they don't have to go through life. If you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, you don't have to go through life alone, not knowing him. So in our sermon today, who is this Jesus? We're going to be in Matthew. And again, Matthew 21, 1 through 11. And often I say, I think this is a, is a scripture that we know well, that we've heard many times. We know the story. And I think sometimes we take the story, it's about the palms. We're not doing the distribution of palms. We're not handing those out. But this is so much more than just the palms. This is about the freedom that is only found in a true king. So let me read Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come in Bethpage, had come to Bethpage at the Mountain of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, colt the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? 
And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray. Lord, as we read the very words that you have left for us, maybe some of us are stunned. Maybe some of us are confused. Maybe some of us are looking right now and saying, who is this Jesus? And Lord, we need the full outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We need it every day. We need it now. Some may need it more than they can even imagine right now, Lord, as they go through the stress and trials that are taking place in their lives. But Lord, we know that we do have a King, a King, Jesus Christ, who is not just a Lord and Savior, who is the Lord and Savior, who is our Lord and Savior, who is the Lord and Savior of each and every person, should they choose. So Lord, I ask this morning as we take some time in your word and we look at this triumphal entry, it must become more than a historical fact. It must become the entry into our hearts. Whether we've known you for a lifetime, whether we've known you for a minute, whether we may come to know you this morning, Lord, just fill our hearts with the fact that you love us more than we can ever know. And you are the king. You are the God that we've all been seeking. We thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory. And Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. So as we read that triumphal entry, we hear the crowd shouting and we even hear the whole city was stirring. And as I prayed this morning, I said, Lord, let all of our hearts stir for you. Let us all be taking this time that is different, the time that isn't our tradition, and looking to you, looking at your word, and allowing our hearts to open up. Because there's a... There's a simple fact that we go through in our lives. We like to know who people are. I mean, even as we, we look and we prepare to, 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 uh, to film this and record, we look to see who's on the video, who's watching, who has said hello. We want to know who people are. Right now, we want to know where people are. And I think that social media right now has just moved from, oh yeah, I enjoy social media to, I am spending every waking moment that I'm not doing working on social media because there's not a whole lot to do. And it was, even last night, I posted something on Facebook about my daughter. She and her husband are pregnant. It's thrilling, it's exciting. And I said, wow, look at all the people that are congratulating. I said, what, what a great thing, very emotional for me. What a great thing for social media to be able to share this happiness. My daughter and her husband were on the phone and they, and they told us and we, we were thrilled. And they, and they said, well, what do we do about a gender reveal? I said, well, you'll get to that. They told us, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna share that this morning, but Social media is powerful. That is sometimes how we get to know who people are. We even look in the business world. In the business world, we go to LinkedIn. What a great way to find out more about people. We look at a resume. When you're in the business world and you want to hire somebody, oh, I'm going to get to know them. I know these facts about them. Again, Instagram, Facebook. I think if we want to get to know somebody we're trying to find out, don't they call that creeping? on Facebook. I, I don't know, but we look to find out more about looking who somebody is. Or a lot of times it's by word of mouth. We'll ask a friend, we'll ask a co-worker, we'll ask another person. Hey, hey, what do you know about this person? Is this somebody that I, I should get to know? And these are good ways. We get to know the person on the surface. But do we really get a clear picture of them? Sometimes we just see what they want us to see, or we only see what we want to see. So really, we just get an idea. We gain some head knowledge. 
or even as we're, we're looking at now, we think we know somebody based on tradition. Well, I knew their brother, I knew their sister, I knew a friend who was like them. So they're probably like that based on family tradition. But we certainly don't really get to know them. If we just read the words here, and we say, okay, Jesus rode in on a donkey and then laid down palms. Let me go get my palm. We've never come to know Jesus. This morning, I want to look at two questions. And I would like for you to be able to answer them. Maybe it's not going to come easy. Maybe it's not going to be this morning. Maybe it'll be during the week as we move closer to Easter. Who is this Jesus? That's the first question. The second question maybe is so much more important. Do you know this Jesus? I don't mean the historical figure that is Jesus. I don't mean the man that some people say he was a, just a good teacher. He was just a, he was a good man. He was a good prophet. Oh, he was so much more than all that. The problem that many of us face this morning and many of us had, we have all faced it at some point in our life, is that we're separated from God. God's perfect creation was put into place and then we were separated from God. The devil had his way. That is the work of the devil. That is the work that the devil wants to accomplish. He wants to separate us from the love of God. He wants us to never know the answer. Do you know this Jesus? The devil is only happy if you say, no, I don't know him. We need to be able to answer in the affirmative, yes, I know who Jesus is. And let me just be clear on that because that is something that is, oh, come on, the devil, that, that you know, he, he's, he's not really real. He's not like that. He's just the, the kind of, you know, he's that little red guy with the horns and the pitchfork. The devil is real and we have to be aware. And we read in 1 John 3, 8. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. We were all sinners. We all had no hope. We had no way to put this relationship with God back together because the devil thought he had accomplished the feat that he set out to do. He said, I want to be like God. I want to be their God. And therefore, we were all in sin. And yes, Romans 3.23 tells us we are all sinners. We all practice sin. And when we look at the word practice, and we, when we see that used in regards to our sin, and even in... In 1 John 3, 8, we see the word practice. That means our desire is to sin. Before we know the Lord, our desires are sinful. They're not to look to God. They're, look to, they're to look to the world. We practice that. When we come to know Jesus, the practice of our life changes. The desires of our heart change. That doesn't mean if you're sitting there listening this morning, you're saying... I know Jesus, but yet I have sinned. Do I really know him? Yes, if you have made Jesus the Lord of your life, have confessed your sins to him, that doesn't remove the fact that we are still going to slip and fall, but your desire changes. Your desire becomes to please the Lord. Say, Lord, I don't want to sin. I want to please you. I want to continue to see my heart become more like you. That's sanctification. 
But again, sometimes if we're caught up in the sin, if we're, I use the word mired, if we're mired in that sin and we were trying to escape and say, I want to do what is right. I want to do what is good because I know what God did for me is so good. Maybe we need to get a little more clarity on the picture of Jesus. And what a day today is as we celebrate the triumphal entry. We see so much in there as we look at Jesus entering into Jerusalem. When we look at that 1 John 3, 8, and we see that the devil wishes to separate us. The devil will achieve that. The world will achieve that if we only see Jesus as a historical figure and not as the king, not as our king, your king, my king, the loving king. If we can't get to that point, we lose out on so much. And I would beg you this morning, as we look at the scripture, and we see seven different ways in which Jesus is king in these 11 verses, and start to take that into your heart to know that whatever you're struggling with this morning, whatever you're going through, the triumphal entry is not just a historic fact. It is the entry of Jesus into your life. So maybe when you're reading that, and we read that this morning, the triumphal entry, you say, well, oh, seven different ways in which Jesus is described as king. Ways in which Jesus is king. Ways in which he is the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings, the ruler over all. And it really is amazing when we look at this. Because the very first thing we see, starting in verse 3, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. We are seeing right here the picture of the divine king. Jesus is not just like a worldly king. He is the divine king. Jesus is God and he's man. There is nobody, there has never been, there will never be anybody else like him. Jesus is announcing as he approaches Jerusalem that I am the king. You say, well, he can just announce it, but you see that he's all-knowing because divinity references God. And Jesus is saying right there, this is what you will find and he will give it to you. God is omniscient. He knows all things. And there was no doubt that the donkey and the colt would be there. And even as we look at this story in Luke, we see Luke give a different detail. He says, you will find a man carrying a water bucket. Men didn't carry water buckets ever in Jerusalem in biblical times. Only women did that. Yet Jesus said, you will see a man doing that. That's how they knew who to ask. Jesus is showing his omniscience in all things. He's saying, I am not just a worldly king. I am the king. And then he announces that the animals are to be untied or loosed. These animals will be untied. Again, he's saying, this is what you will find. This is what you will do. This is what will happen. I am king over all creation. And we're always careful that we don't want to spiritualize everything in the Bible. But I think as we look at that, we can't help but see, and it struck me this week, the king of all creation, just by the simple statement, he said, his creation can be untied, can be loosed, can be freed, to be used by him. 
the triumphal entry is more than just a ride up a hill into Jerusalem. It's a triumphal entry into each one of your hearts where Jesus is saying, I will untie you from that sin. I will loose those chains that are holding you down. I will release the bonds that have kept you from me because I am your divine king. Isn't that incredible? The divine king. But it doesn't stop there. Because then we read in verses 4 and 5. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughters of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. What Jesus is quoting there is Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9, 9 and 9, 10. Now, if you have your Bibles with you and you have them open, keep, your, keep, your, uh, keep Matthew 21 marked and then kind of keep something or keep your finger in Zechariah because we're going to go back and forth. Because we're seeing Jesus as the prophesied king. The prophecies of the Old Testament have all been pointing forward to Jesus. What we're seeing quoted there in Matthew is Zechariah 9.9, 9. and it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout and triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, speaking as the nation of Israel is coming out of exile. They're being released they're being freed. And he's talking about, and the temple would be rebuilt. To the date, this was about 483 years, what we see in Matthew, of when the temple was being restored. This is a historical date. This is not accidental that Jesus was making his triumphal entry into the lives of his people back into Jerusalem. He has come back. This is the prophesied king. It was spoken by Zechariah the prophet, the very words of God the Father, that this will happen. Who else but God would ordain this and make this happen? And here we see Jesus, the prophesied king. But God's word doesn't stop there because then we look at verse 9 and now we see a divine king. We see a prophesied king. Oh boy. But we see a savior king. Matthew 21, 9. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, that very word means save now. Save now. How many times have we cried out to the Lord, save me now. The people who were there were seeing Jesus as their Savior and they cried out, Hosanna, save now. And these words are not foreign to anybody. They're from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. O oh Lord, do save, we beseech you. O oh Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, who have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The people have been crying out since the very beginning for a Savior who would save them, who would bring prosperity. And let me be clear, prosperity is the knowledge of Jesus Christ in your heart. They're crying out to the only one who can save. The only one who can restore the relationship with God. Hosanna, save now. And that takes us to John 14, 6. We have to look at John 14, 6. If you are listening this morning and you've never heard the truth of John 14, 6, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through the Son. 
Hosanna, save now. There is only one way to prosperity. There is only one way to eternal life. There is only one way to freedom from your sin. There is only one way that the chains that are grabbing your heart this morning will be broken. And that is by Jesus Christ, who is the King, who is Savior King. Save now. The people were crying out, Hosanna, save now. It's directed at Jesus at no one else. They knew the one who releases, who sets free. This was happening at the Passover in Jerusalem. Passover is the celebration of people from their slavery. The nation of Israel was set free and they were celebrating. Who remember the story of Passover? They had slaughtered the lamb. They had taken the blood of the lamb. They had put it on the doorposts. And they were saved from death. The angel of death passed over their homes. And their families were spared from death. Save now. John 129. The very moment we are seeing Jesus, John the Baptist. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The only one. John 1 36. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. This morning, you need to look to Jesus. And you can look to Jesus and say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away my sin. I would encourage you right now, if you're sitting there, if you're standing there, wherever it is you're watching, say, Behold, the Lamb of God who has taken away my sin. He is the Savior King. He is the divine king. He is the prophesied king. He is the savior king. A savior king who was there, who is there, who will always be there, and one day will return with us, his believers. He's more than just a historical figure. Do you know this Jesus this morning? But then we continue in Matthew because this is so important. God's word is not going to let us miss it. We see Jesus, the gentle, loving, righteous king. A king who arrives on a donkey, on a colt, on a donkey colt. Wait, how are kings supposed to arrive? Well, we've seen time and time again when the kings of war came in. When the kings came in to lord it over the people, they arrived and they said, I am the king. And people trembled and people feared. Jesus is arriving and they're laying down their coats. They're laying palm branches down. They are worshiping him. And he is a gentle, loving, righteous King arriving on a donkey. Jesus came in poverty, not in riches. Even not like the kings of the world, the leaders of the world we see today. Sometimes I think we can't help but look. We look at these incredible inaugurations. I mean, I don't want to pick on England, but my gosh. What a lot of pomp and circumstance for a king and queen. But the real king came in, riding up a dirt road that coats were laid down for him and palms were laid down for him, riding on a donkey. He said, I'm with you. I love you. I will die for you. What a difference we see 
when we look to Jesus, the very Jesus who wants to know you this morning. See in Isaiah 11, 4. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. You say, well, that's not a gentle, loving, righteous king. Most certainly is. A gentle, loving, righteous king does everything that is good, fair, and righteous. And he loves deeply. And we see this peaceful king. The fifth description is the peaceful king. Again, the imagery of riding on a donkey. This symbolizes peace. A horse would have signified war. And like I said, if you, if you kept your finger in Zechariah, go back to Zechariah 9. And this time we'll look at the first half of, of Zechariah 9, 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the bow of war will be cut off and he will speak peace to the nations. Jesus comes speaking peace. Even in Luke, as Luke details the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, he writes, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Jesus is a peaceful king. And you know what? That is really good news for all of us this morning. Because in Romans 5.10, we see that Jesus has come in peace. And I'm going to say this again. If you have not accepted Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, if you're just for the first time saying, I'm learning who this Jesus is, he has come for all of us in peace. Romans 5.10. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When we didn't know Jesus Christ, when we didn't know that he was a king, he gave his very life for us so that we could have our lives. He is the only way for true peace. He is the peaceful king. And then we see, as we look in Matthew, he is a king over all things. We see this description. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Save now in the highest. He is above all things. A king over all things. And even as we look in the second half of Zechariah 9.10, and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. There is no other king. This morning, there is no other king. But the beauty of it is, there is no worldly king who can ever love you like Jesus loves you this morning. There is no way anybody can love you as much as Jesus loved you, loves you, and will love you. Here is the king of all things, riding in on a donkey, on a dirty, dusty road, with people all around him shouting. He was riding in to a city that didn't know him, that he had just been weeping over the city because he knew that the city would not truly come to know him. This morning, you need to picture a king, a worldly king, who has wept for you, who has wept with you, who will weep for you, but who will walk with you through the hardest moments of your life and the greatest moments of your life. There is no other king like that. And you say, well, this is enough. This is, this is the king. I, I, I'm seeing this, but, but no, there is one more. 
He is the messianic king. He is the Messiah. He is the savior. He is the all in all. Who is this Messiah? We see in 21.10, when he, Jesus, had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, who is this? Maybe a better word that is a more accurate, sometimes stirred, is the whole city was shaken. People were shaken to their core. They were stirred. Their hearts were moving. They were looking and saying, who is this? He is the Messiah. They had already proclaimed him the son of David. They knew from studying their words, the word that scripture told them that the Messiah would be from the line of David. And they already heralded him, son of David. Save now, they were shouting, to the son of David. They were stirred to their hearts. They knew there was hope. Some of these people knew. They were stirred and their lives were changed. Because these very people, these poor people, those who at one time were poor in spirit, who were overrun by the Romans, who had been overrun by the by the religious elite, they were stirred and they saw the Messiah, the humble king, enter in, the messianic king. The people knew as their hearts were stirred. Did everyone know? We absolutely know as we read through. Not everybody knew. Jesus wept. He wept for that city. Now the question is, not did they know. Do you know? Do you know who this Jesus is? This Jesus is your king. Maybe he's the king you've been waiting for. Maybe he's the king that you didn't know you needed, but you've been trying to fill the hole in your heart with all the kingly things of the world, with all the idols of the world. Maybe you've tried fake kings. Maybe you've tried false religions, but you haven't known Jesus. John 14, 26. Let me read this to you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to your remembrance all that I said to you. You guys can come up and we'll ready to worship as I finish. The whole city was stirred. I would challenge you this morning, if you're being stirred, if this has been a hard time in your life, if there have been some hard times and you've said, I've looked for a king, I've tried this, I've tried that, I've tried so many things, but nothing has ever stirred my heart. And this morning you can say, there's something stirring in my heart. Because Jesus promised there in John that as he came, he would serve us. But as he left us, something greater would come. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit came when Jesus entered into Jerusalem 
he hung on a cross and he died. He had to do that so that the Holy Spirit could come and stir each one of us. This morning, maybe we call it a tugging on our hearts. Maybe you're coming to a point and saying, well, what do you mean the other gods of this world? I think deep down we know what those other gods are. You've been seeking a relationship God. The God who comes in the form of addiction to drugs or alcohol, gambling. A God who comes in the, the form of of food, of eating, of gluttony. I, I don't know. A God who has overtaken your heart and crushed you and tied you down with chains. And this morning you're feeling a tugging on your heart. Say, wait a minute, those chains can be broken. Jesus says, yes, they can be broken. They will be broken if you let me in. If you will know that I am your divine king, I am your prophesied king, I am your peaceful king, I am your righteous king, I am your gentle king, I am your savior king, I am your Messiah king. Those chains can be broken, can be ripped apart, and life will change forever. And it's not about tradition. Maybe you've been coming to church for I don't know how many years, Maybe you show up at church on Palm Sunday and you get a palm and say, that's the tradition I know. Throw that tradition out the window in this morning and say, Jesus, you are my king. What a time to do it. A time where the world is going crazy. Where many are dying who probably don't know Jesus. But that doesn't have to be any of us. Because we can know Jesus this morning. And the very stirring we read of the people in Jerusalem. That stirring this morning, tugging on your heart, moving you, calling to you, loving you, is the Holy Spirit saying, you need to know Jesus. Maybe say, I do know Jesus, but I've drifted. That tugging is, you're being pushed to seek him and know him more to be able to turn to him when things get really hard, when you're lonely, when you say, I don't, I don't, you know, we can all joke about social distancing and isolating ourselves, but I just can't do it. Jesus, I need something more. And he's there. And this is the time to turn to him. I know that there's going to be some hard things and maybe Jesus, maybe that Holy Spirit is moving in you this morning and calling you to put down the things of the world because those things have never given you what you're seeking and they never will give you what you're seeking. There's a lot here this morning. This is more than just seven descriptions of a king. This is a king who has given his life for you so that you could have peace, love, and joy and have the chains broken. And wherever you are in your walk this morning, in your journey, if you've known Jesus a long time, we're going to go back to John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And this morning, I encourage you to let those chains be broken. To say, Jesus, you are my Savior King. Hosanna. Save now. Let's pray and then we're going to worship. Oh Lord, you are so good. We so much need a message of joy in this morning as we read in Matthew of you triumphantly entering into Jerusalem. Lord, fill us by the power of your Holy Spirit with the confidence that we know you, the King, Savior King, Messiah King, 
the King who we can cry out to Hosanna, save now. Lord, I lift up every person watching and listening that their lives may be forever changed. Lord, that we just don't go through an existence where we think we know, we might know, we kind of know. Lord, that we do know that you are the only true God, the one true living God who has never left us nor forsaken us. Lord, with all that people are going through right now, Lord, you know what's in the lives of each and every person listening and watching. You know the fears. You know the trials. You know the joys. You know what each of us need to have that hole filled in our heart. Lord, we've tried to plug so many things in there over the years. We've tried to plug things in there to fill that hole. Nothing will. Only you can fill the hole in each of our hearts. So Lord, I lift up our church community to you. The church community that is spread out. A church community that is not bound by tradition, but is bound by you. Lord God Almighty, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, minister to each of us. Lord, allow us to pray for each other. Lord, allow us to serve each other. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for knowing us. We thank you. Even though we were sinners, you never turned from us. And you never will turn from us. And you love each of us dearly and deeply. Lord, you adopted us into your family because you want us. You desire for all of us to know you and be able to bring you glory and one day live in your glory. So Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that you're not a God bound by tradition. You're not a God bound by buildings. You are not a God bound by anything but a love for us. So Lord, as we worship you one more time today, let it be pleasing to you. Hear our hearts. Hear our hearts, Lord, and fill our hearts with the joy and the love that only comes from you, Messiah King. We thank you, Lord. We love you and praise you. And Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Your breath in our lungs, so 
This morning, I would encourage you to say, this is the triumphal entry, and make today the triumphal entry that Jesus enters into your heart. If you say, I do know Jesus, let it be the triumphal entry to rejoice, to recapture, to grow in that love. I'm going to close us this morning in Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you during the week. God bless each one of you. Amen.